Hey guys, Carl from Purple Moose Plays. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the solo hidden movement deduction game Black Sonata from TGG Games, Sideroom Games, and designer John Keane, in which the player finds themselves tracking Shakespeare's mysterious dark lady across Elizabethan London, picking up clues along the way, and ultimately trying to determine the true identity of the dark lady. I do have to mention here that I was given a review copy of this game from the publisher, but as always, I will do my best to share my actual opinions and thoughts on the game. And barring that, there's also the playthrough in this video for you to make your own decisions as well. With all that being said, let's head down to the table for the playthrough, and then I'll meet you back up here to let you know what I think about the game. To set up a game of Black Sonata, begin by placing the board out on the table and placing your player pawn at any location on the board. That location will be your starting point. Um, for this game, I will start down here at Blackfriars. Next, place the four tracker tokens and seven deduction tokens off to the side of the board. Next, take the deck of fog cards, shuffle those up, and place those off to the side of the board as well. The next thing we need to do is we need to decide on the dark lady for the game or the person that we're trying to identify by the end of the game. So you're going to do that by taking these dark lady cards, shuffling them up and choosing one to be the target of that game. So this one is going to get placed here slightly under the edge of the game board. And I need to figure out by the end of the game which dark lady is on the other side of that card. And the next thing we need to do is we need to look at this symbol right here and find the other card in the deck with the matching symbol. So in this case, we're looking for this card right here. I'm going to set this down here with the location cards on top of that card. This card will be revealed when we've managed to visit every location on the game board. Then we're going to take the rest of these cards, shuffle them up, and place this Dark Lady Clues card on top of the deck to keep the top card a secret. So again, I will shuffle those without looking. And then I will place this Dark Lady's Clue card on top, and I'll set those up here at the top. Finally, we need to set up the deck that's going to describe or going to show which locations the Dark Lady is moving through. And this is sort of the location that's going to dictate the movement of the Dark Lady through the game. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to take these cards and you're going to look at these letters that are printed on the card. In this case, I'm using this top right letter to set up the deck. And what you want to do is starting at the top, you want to go in alphabetical order. So you'll see here I've got A, B, C, D, E, and so on, all the way down to Z. There will always be several cards that does not have a letter in the spot that you were using to set up the deck. So those cards will be set aside and won't be used in that play of the game. Once you've gotten all the cards in alphabetical order, you're going to then randomly cut that deck in half. And you can do that as many times as you want to. So I'll cut one more time and we will start with the deck like this. So this is going to be the first location or the first type of location that the Dark Lady will start at. And this deck is going to stay in my hand while I play the game, but for right now, so I can explain the game, I will put this down. Sorry, there is one more thing that we need to do. We need to take this card, and this is sort of going to be a timer for our game. And depending on which difficulty level you decide this will start differently, but for the normal difficulty level, we're going to start at the number two. And this is going to count down every time we reach the end of this deck. So I'm going to place this with the number two face up at the bottom of this deck. All right, so before I go ahead and get into the play, of course I need to explain briefly how the game works. But first thing I wanna do is this. I can see that the Dark Lady is going to start at a location that has a house symbol on it. 
this house representing Shakespeare's residence. So it's a location on the map that does have a residence that Shakespeare lived in at some point during his career. The game comes with these very nice tracker tokens that looks like the Dark Lady's head. And we can use these tokens to help us sort of figure out where she is and where she's going and so on. So I'm going to start by placing one of those in each of the locations that has one of those house symbols on it, just so I have an idea of the, any of the possible locations she could be. So right now, anywhere at those locations that have that marker on them could be the current location of the Dark Lady. All right, so rather than trying to explain all of the details about how this game plays before getting into things, I think it's going to make a lot more sense to explain all of the smaller details while I'm playing. So what I'd rather do right now is sort of just give you a broad overview of the game, what the goals are, and sort of how a general turn will play out. So the goal of this game is we're going to be trying to track the Dark Lady as she travels around London, picking up clues about the Dark Lady, and then ultimately trying to determine what the Dark Lady sort of is represented by, so that we can determine who is the Dark Lady by identifying on this card the three symbols that are shown on the opposite side of this card. And those three symbols are going to come from these seven symbols right here. And those symbols are going to be basically representative of those actual people that are shown on the card. So those symbols mean amorous, has children, is literary or creative, has court connections, is musical, has some kind of documented link to Shakespeare, or is married. So again, on this card, there are three of these symbols and we're going to be picking up clues to try and deduce what those three symbols are. Once we know what those three symbols are, we again have to end up in the same location as the lady, search for her, and then correctly identify those three symbols to win the game. And this is going to be playing out based on this deck right here. This deck again is going to show the locations that the dark lady is moving through. It's basically going to be her AI that's going to run how she moves around London. And again, every time this card comes up to the top of the deck, we're going to rotate down to the next lowest number. If at any point this card shows up with the zero at the top, meaning we would have to turn it down one number and cannot, the game immediately ends and we've lost the game. So we have a sort of ticking timer that we need to beat to identify who the Dark Lady is and then confront her with that information to successfully win the game. On every turn, what's going to happen is we're going to take the top card of this deck and put it to the back of the deck. And it's going to show us a new symbol, which is going to tell us, or at least give us an idea of where the Dark Lady has moved on that turn. And then we get to take our turn. And on our turn, we have basically three choices to make. We can move to an adjacent location, we can choose to search the location we're in for the Dark Lady if we think she happens to be in our location. And if she does, we then either draw a new clue or we can confront her with our, ide our ideas of which three symbols are on the card. And finally, the other option is if one of these fog cards is at the top of the deck, we're able to, if we choose to do so, reveal that fog card and do whatever the ability or the action that is printed on that card. And sometimes those will be very helpful and sometimes those will actually hurt us a little bit. Also, anytime that we search for the Dark Lady, whether we are successful or not successful, the Dark Lady is going to move a number of locations equal to the number of clue cards that we have showing at that time, which means she's basically running away from us and trying to escape whether we saw her or not. And it's going to sort of make us have to pay attention again where she might be as we've sort of lost the trail where she is. And again, the more clues we have, the further she's going to run and the more difficult that will become. A few more things that are worth mentioning. These fog cards, every time we search for the Dark Lady, we're going to slide one of these fog cards under the top card of this deck so that we don't see the next card when we search. And I'll show you how the searching actually works when we get to that point in the game. Also, anytime we use a fog card from the top of the deck, we're also going to slide a new fog card underneath that one, again, to prevent us from seeing what the next card is. But also what that means is when that fog card comes back through this deck again, 
there's going to be one turn that we don't know where the Dark Lady has gone, and we cannot search for her on that turn. But you'll see how that works as we play. The other thing you see down here are location cards, and under those location cards, there is a clue card. And what this means is every time I visit a location, and it doesn't count the location where you start, every time I visit a location, I can take the card of that location. And that card will be used when we're searching in that location for the Dark Lady. But also, if we manage to collect all of the location cards, we will get one clue for free as well. So that's basically it for how the game plays. I am obviously going to be talking my way through this game, and I hope that all of the sort of details and small things that I haven't mentioned yet will come up as I play, and I will make sure to explain anything that is new as I play through the game. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Again, I should be holding this in my hand while I play the whole game. So again, we've got the Dark Lady starting at one of the places that has a Shakespeare residence, which are these four locations. I don't know where she is, but she could even possibly be in the same location I am in right now. Now, because we used the top letters when we were setting up the deck, this means that every single turn, the Dark Lady will move to another location, and that location is always going to be adjacent to the location that she is currently in. So even if we see the same symbol, say for example, on the next card, there's another house, she will not stay in this location, but she could move from this house to this house. So we need to make sure that we're understanding every single turn she is going to be moving somewhere. And that will help us try and figure out where she is. All right, so we start again each turn by taking this top card, moving it to the bottom of the deck, and we see now that she's in a location with a tree or a rural location. And the only two rural locations are here and here. So she clearly wasn't in that location. She must have been in one of these three, but that means she's either moved there or there. And she must be in one of those two locations. So I could move, but as soon as I move, she's going to move again. So there's no reason for me to chase her because I can't search in the same turn that I move. And you'll see the location that I'm in, the gatehouse, actually has three symbols. Yes, but officially, actually, I don't have that location card until I've moved into that location. So I think we will need to move if we're going to hope to catch her. And she may actually be all the way over here. So I'm going to take one step in this direction, and we will pull out the card for St. Paul's. And every location card we have, I'll place down here to remember that we have that location. And now we'll see where she moves next. She moves to a house. So from those two locations means she could move to this one. She may have moved to this one, or she may have moved to this one. And I'm actually going to move here because this is the only coin or the only commercial area that's next to any of her current locations. Also, this is the only beer or tavern that's next to any of her locations. So if I see coin or tavern come up on the next card, then I'll know for sure that she's in one of those locations. So that's not a bad place to be. And that means I get to take the Cornhill location card. All right, let's see where she goes next. Oh, all right. So she's moved to a church. And again, she has to have moved, so she cannot be still in this location because that would mean she hadn't moved. And there are no churches in that area, so she's not there. So either she's moved up here or she's moved over here. And there's still a hope that the next card could be a commercial area or those stack of coins. So I'm going to actually not do anything this turn and hope that she comes to me. And let's see what happens. Ha <laughs> ha! All right, so we got very lucky. She's moving to a stack of coins or a commercial area, and there isn't one here, there isn't one here. So the only place she could possibly be is in the same location that I am currently in. So I am going to search. So when we search, as I said, we will take the top card of the fog deck and we will place it under this top card. And then we will take that card. And I'm gonna set this stack down just for a minute so I have two hands. And what we're going to do is you're going to place that card on top of the location card for the current location you're in, which is Cornhill. And you'll see 
in this card, there is a hole. So we're gonna put that card on top of this and we'll turn it upside down. And if we see the dark lady's face in this magnifying glass, then we've successfully found her current location. So again, we're going to place this on top of the deck. We will flip it over and you can see, in this case, there is a face in that spot. So we have successfully found the dark lady at this location. So when we do that, this movement card gets discarded because now it's going to be a cloud or a fog symbol from now on. So anytime she's in this location, I won't know where she is. And because we've successfully found her, we will take the top clue card. And let me explain now how we use these clue cards. So on this clue card, first, these are the three symbols that I mentioned before we're going to need to figure out on our own Dark Lady card. But the way we use this card is we're going to look over here at the symbols. And our Dark Lady is represented by this sort of purple flower down here at the bottom. And here we see a zero slash two. That means our Dark Lady card has exactly two of these symbols or none of those symbols. So this is not a great card to start with because it doesn't give me a whole lot of information, but I'm going to set those tiles aside just for now. So we've got the heart, the crown, and the chain. So we know either two of those are correct or none of those are correct. And we're going to need to learn more about her through other clues to find out better what we know. So I'm going to leave that up here at the top. All right. So then because we searched for the Dark Lady, the deck is going to move forward a number of cards equal to the number of clue cards that are showing right now. We only have one. So we're just going to move this top fog card to the bottom of the deck. And now we know that she's moved to a location that has a tavern, which must be this one next to us because that's the only one that's connected. And now we start a new turn. So at the start of the new turn, this moves forward again and she moves to a location with a boat or that's on the riverside. So clearly she's moving now to London Bridge. So I'm going to move down to East Cheap mostly because I haven't been there yet, so I will get a new location card, but also because there's a slim chance that she might come back up and that would be great if she did. So let's see what happens. The next location is, ha ha, she did, ah, or did she? There's also a tavern down here. So there's a possibility she went down and there's a possibility she went up. It's still early in the game. I do have a lot of fog cards left. So I'm going to take that 50-50 chance and I'm going to search for her again. So we put that cloud card in the deck. I think she might be an East Cheap. We put that here on the East Cheap location card and we flip. So now you can see this is what happens when we don't find the dark lady. The magnifying glass is empty. We haven't found anything. Unfortunately, she was not in this location and she was actually down here. All right, so again, we're going to discard that card. The dark lady will move forward one location, which is going to be one of these playhouse areas which means she has to have gone there. And then starting a new turn, she moves again to a church. The only church that's connected is here in Southwark. And I will continue following her around because I do want to keep getting these locations. So I'm going to find London Bridge. So now I've got another location and there is a possibility she'll come back towards me. So we move to the next card and I got very lucky because I see coins. There's nothing here. We know she was here and the only location next to that with coins is where I am. So I am going to search again for the dark lady, put in our fog card, put that down for a second. We will flip over and you can see we did manage to find her one more time. So again, this gets discarded, the location gets returned and we will take a look at our next clue card. All right, so now my next clue card says, this is purple, this is one matching me. 
exactly two of these are correct. Now, if we look at the other card, we know that there are only three total symbols that are correct. So it could be that this heart is one of them, and then they each have one more that is correct. Or it could be that these two are correct, and the heart is not correct, which means none of those are correct because then we would have four and that's not possible. So either these two are correct or a heart and one of each of these is the correct answer. So I'm going to set that heart as its own sort of option and the others, I don't know about these four. These two could be correct and these two could be correct and we'll leave the others off to the side for now. Because if the heart is not correct and these two are correct, then all three of these are not correct. And that would mean that either the music instrument or the rattle is correct. So this is giving us a nice step in the right direction to figure out some more information. All right, so we do have two cards showing now, so she is going to advance two cards and I don't get to see the second card. So we're moving two cards together to the bottom of the deck. And now we've got one of those house symbols. It means she's moved two spaces from here and is at a house. So it could be one, two there. Could be one, two there. And then she will move one more time before my turn as her normal movement. So now she's at a playhouse. It means could be there or could be there. And I need to continue, I need to go to these two locations anyway, so I'm going to continue moving around that direction and we'll see what she does next. So her next location is going to be a house again, which means she may have come back here, or she may have come back here, or she may have gone from here to there. And yeah, I'm gonna keep my movement this way. I get this new location and we'll see what happens next. All right, we've got a tree and the only trees are up here in the top corners means she must be there or there and this is not correct, but that's fine because I'm also completing locations as we move around the board. So I'm going to continue doing that and go to Black Friars. And she moves again to a house, which means she could be there, she could be there, or she could be where I am, but I'm not going to take a one in three chance for now. We've got lots of time. There's no reason to rush it and waste fog cards. So I'm going to continue my, yeah, exploration a bit and go up here to Clerkenwell. And let's see where she goes next. Haha, -ha. she goes to a tree. So she could be there or she could be with me. Now it's a 50-50 chance. I'm more happy to try that. So we're gonna search again where we are, put the fog card back and we are in Clerkenwell. So let's see what happens. We flip the card over and oh boy, I got lucky. She is in fact in Clerkenwell with me. This card gets discarded. So we will look at the next clue. All right, so see what we got. All right, this one again says exactly two are correct. We've got a chain, we've got an inkwell, and we've got a rattle. Now remember, there are only three total things. So now I know if both of these have two things that are correct, there must be something in common. And I know now that we must have the inkwell is definitely one of the three symbols on my card. And we know that a second one must be true. Now, this is where it's gonna get interesting. Both of these have at least two correct. This one may or may not have two correct. Sorry, not at least, exactly two, exactly two, and either zero or two. So we could probably figure this out 
Let's see what I can do, but it may be a little bit too much thinking with only three cards. Let's see what we got. That one is definitely true. Means the other two symbols must be one of these four. And it could be the heart and the chain, in which case this is correct. It's definitely not a crown. So we could definitely eliminate the crown. It's very likely heart and chain. But if heart and chain are incorrect, then it must be the ring and the rattle. So either the heart and chain is correct, because in this case it would be two, two, and two that are correct, or the ring and rattle are correct, in which case this is zero, two, and two. So we're going to need at least one more clue card to see if we can identify which of those two pairs is correct. So let's keep going and see what happens. But now we have three clue cards showing, so I do need to advance the deck by three. One, two, three moves here. So the dark lady has moved three spaces from where I am and is now at a playhouse. So she could be there, she could be there, she could be there. And we move to the next turn. Let's see what happens. She moves to a house. Means maybe here, maybe from here to here, maybe from here back to here, and maybe from here to here. So she's in one of the four houses. That doesn't really help me, but we still need Cripplegate, Shoreditch, and Bishopsgate for our location. So I'm going to move here to get another location card. Because if I can get this clue, that might be just enough to figure out who she is. All right, next she moves again to a house, which means this one is not next to any houses. She couldn't have been there. This one also is not next to any houses. She couldn't have been there. So these two possibly are, and they could have swapped either one. So we're gonna leave both of those there. But I'm not going to chase her because there's only two more locations for me to get to to get this clue card. And there's a chance that she comes around this way or comes through this way. So I'm going to go to Shoreditch and take that location. And then I will swap to the next card. She's at a church, which means she could have gone here. She could have gone from here to here, or she could have gone over here. And both of these are sort of headed in this direction. So I'm going to complete my collection of locations. I've now got this last location. And I'm going to take a look at this clue card right here. And this clue card tells me that only one of these is correct. And we already know that the inkwell is correct. That means heart and chain are both incorrect. So I know now that heart and chain are both incorrect. So let's go back and see what that means. First, this card, heart and chain are incorrect. That means the only one that's left is this one, but it says zero or two. So that means all of these are incorrect. So I know for sure the crown is also incorrect. This one, we know that heart is incorrect. And this says it must be exactly two correct. It means inkwell and ring must be correct. And finally, this one, same thing. It says we must have two we now know that chain is not correct. So inkwell and rattle must be correct. So that means my three symbols must be inkwell, ring, and rattle. It means this person was literary, they were married, and they had children. So now all I need to do is finish tracking down the dark lady and confront her with my information. So, Let's see where she goes next. All right, she's going to a coin, which means she could be here or here. Definitely wasn't there. I'm going to move to the pub or the tavern down here because there's only, ah, that's not true. It could be here as well. Hold on. If I stay there, no because there's a church here, a church here, and a church here, that's no good. 
There's a house here and a house here, which running away wouldn't be great. Yeah, I'm going to move into East Cheap and we'll see if there's a tavern. We also haven't seen any of the fog cards come back yet, so we'll see what happens. Oh, look at that. There's a very strong chance that she moved with me, but she could also be down here. You know what? I'm going to risk it. I've got a lot of fog cards left. I'm going to see, see if she's with me right now. Because if she is, I could have successfully confronted the Dark Lady. She is in East Cheap, possibly. We're going to put that there. I'm going to flip that and... Huh? Sorry, I somehow grabbed two cards. <laughs> that was the fog card I just put in. Okay, so we're going to flip this and see what happens. And look at that. She is in fact in East Cheap. And now if my deduction was correct, it should be ink, ring, and rattle. I will flip this card over and look at that. Ink, rattle, and ring. We have successfully identified and confronted Jacqueline Field. Now I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to show you any of the fog cards because they didn't come up before I was able to identify the Dark Lady. So let me just go ahead and show you a couple of those so you can see what they would have done if we use them. Um, and I'll just take this one right here off the top of the deck. Actually, no, I won't. I'm not going to touch the deck for a minute because we're going to do scoring. But before we do that, let me do show you some of these fog cards. So for example, this one just says discard this card. It does nothing. But when you discard a fog card, it's removed from the game completely. And remember, you need fog cards in order to search for the Dark Lady. So if they ever run out, you cannot win the game and the game will end immediately. So when you discard a fog card, that's a pretty bad thing to happen. Here's another one. Move your pawn to any location of your choice. That would be actually pretty good because if she was all the way across the map, I could sort of move my pawn to find her or to get closer to where she might be. Now, you'll notice this one doesn't say discard. If I had used this from the top of the deck during the game, it would have gotten put back to the bottom of my fog deck. So it could get placed back into the movement deck later on in the game. And one more just so you can see some more variability. Oh, this is a big one. Shuffle the Dark Lady card into the clue deck and draw a new Dark Lady card. So this is actually going to be very interesting because everything you've been working towards is going to get changed, but you still have all of your clue cards to identify the new Dark Lady as well. So it may or may not be a good thing or may or may not be a bad thing depending on how good your clues were for the Dark Lady you already had and how good the clues are for the, uh, the new Dark Lady that's been replaced. All right, so I have successfully won the game, but if you would like to, when you win the game, there's actually a method for scoring. And the way that scoring works is this. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to count the number of cards that are remaining on top of the deck until this timer card. In this case, I only have one card left before that timer card. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to multiply the number that's currently showing at the top front side of the timer card times the number of cards in this movement deck. And remember, we set up the deck with A through Z, and every time we take a fog card, we discard one of these. So there should be 26 cards in this deck unless you're playing with one of the alternate movement decks listed in the back of the rulebook. So in this case, it's going to be one plus two times 26, which is 52 plus one is 53. Then in addition to those points, you're going to add two points for every card that's remaining in the fog deck. So in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five times two is 10 points. So again, we had two times 26 is 52 plus one is 53 plus 10, right, two times five is 63 points. So I've managed to get a score of 63 points to win the game. Now you will see in the back of the rule book on the scoring page, there is a small sort of ranking chart here. And it seems like I've done very, very, very well this game. I've scored above 60, which is the highest level. I am an immortal bard. 
All right, so while we're down here, let's take a look at the components. Um, let's start with these wooden bits. These wooden bits are great. I didn't really use them to their full purpose because on the back side of these, there's actually a gray side. So instead of sliding them back and forth off the table like I had been doing, you could just flip them over so that the gray side shows that's not possible and the black side shows that is likely or that is possible. But I really, really, really love wooden bits and these are very nice bits. The symbols are incredibly clear on both sides, both the dark version and the grayed out version. Um, and they're just a really nice way to sort of keep track of your thoughts about the clues and about which of the symbols you're thinking about. Um, the pawn, it's a wooden pawn. I wouldn't have minded if it was shaped a little bit more uniquely. This is a very sort of standard generic wooden pawn, but that's not a knock against it. It works, it's functional, and again, I like wooden components. And finally, these tracking tokens. These are really cool, and I will talk about this a bit more when I talk about how the game plays, but I think these are really, really great addition to the game. I love the way that they're sort of a silhouette of a, the side of a woman's face. And it just, it really helps to have them on the board and to help me track where she might be, where she might have gone. And I think they're a really good addition. And again, more chunky wooden bits makes me happy. Um, the clue cards themselves are very clearly written out. The clues are very clear. The different colors and different flower shapes are great. If you're colorblind, you're gonna have no problems here because all of the symbols are unique and all of the cards have both color and symbol on them. So that's really nice to have. Um, I did read in the book that some of the portraits, whenever possible, are a portrait of the actual person that's described on the card. But a lot of those people weren't of import enough to have actual portraits of them survive from that time. So a lot of the portraits in this game are just other portraits from that era that have been used as stand-ins, but that's fine. I, I mean, it looks very nice. They are at least matching the person that they're supposed to be, and they're all unique and they all look very nice. So I like that a lot. Um, the movement cards. It's very easy to set up the deck. They give you eight different ways to set up the deck. You're never going to remember that the way that they, they come out, how she moves. And again, I'll talk more about this later as I talk about the game itself. But I think this idea of setting up the cards based on these letters is a very smart one. I think the design of the card makes it very useful. And finally, the locations are great because they show sketches of the location, I believe from an actual map, which is great. And not only that, the, the way that they work in tandem to use this magnifying glass on these cards is just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful component idea. And again, I will describe a lot more about this in my review of the game because I just think this is a really, really cool system. And yeah, the components make that work very well. And then of course the symbols on here, big, easily seen, very di distinguishable from each other, very easy to see on the board. Again, the board is a gorgeous map of London. Everything is color coded, symbol coded, lots of text on the map. I think it just looks all over a, a great presentation. Now, finally, the last thing I do like to talk about when I talk about these things, uh, sorry, there's one more thing I should talk about because I didn't really point it out while I was playing, but on the back of each of the location cards, there are also snippets from the sonatas that Shakespeare wrote. And I think that didn't need to be there. I mean, realistically, just the magnifying glass is the important part of the card, but it really makes them tie in and brings in that theme, just all that little bit more. And I think that's, that's pretty cool to see that on there. All right, so as I was saying, the other thing I like to do while I'm down here is look at, at the insert for the game. The game comes in a fairly standard small size box with this insert in it. And if it was just this insert, you'll see the cards fit very nicely in here. The wooden bits fit very nicely in one of these. And the big cards fit very nicely in here. And if that was all I was given, I'd be perfectly happy. Yes, of course, I'll put these into baggies. That's fine. But the important thing is, in addition to that insert, the game also comes with these tough boxes. So all of the small cards will fit right inside this sort of small, thick tuck box. And all of the big cards fit right here inside this tuck box. 
And those tuck boxes fit perfectly inside this insert. So it's just above and beyond what was necessary for this game. Rather than using baggies, they've got these very nice sort of graphically designed tuck boxes that fit into a very well designed insert. And I am very, very happy with the way that this game is packaged. So with all that being said, meet me back up top and we'll talk about how I feel about the game itself. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the playthrough. Before I get into anything else at all, I do want to comment on the playthrough that you just watched because I want to make sure that you don't get the idea that this game is very easy to beat because of the score that I just got. I will say that I've played this game seven times so far and of those seven times, this is only the third time I've ever beaten the game and my previous high score was 43. So this 63 was partially luck based and, and partially obviously because I've been playing the game enough, I've been getting better at the game. Now, also on top of that, there are more difficult levels to the game. We were playing on the base standard level of the game. So there are ways to make the game more difficult if needed. So I just wanted to mention that before I get into my thoughts on the game. Also, one more thing I forgot to mention while I was looking at the components of the game. In addition to everything I showed you, the game also comes with this book. And I want to make sure I mention this book because I think it's a really cool inclusion in this box. And this book is basically a light history guide to everything that's going on in this game. So this dark lady that you're tracking through the game is somebody who comes up in Shakespeare's sonnets fairly often. And throughout history, many people have been trying to read through these sonnets and sort of piece together who this woman is that Shakespeare is talking about in those sonnets. And that's who these people are that you're tracking in this game. In this book, you will learn about all of the locations in the game. You will learn about all of the different women that might have been the Dark Lady. And you will also be able to read some of the snippets of those sonnets themselves. So this is a really, really cool inclusion in the box because it also brings in much more of the theme to the game. So if you're interested in the history, definitely check this book out as well. All right, so with all that being said, let's get into the game itself. So this game sort of has two main components. There's the hidden movement piece and there's the deduction piece. And I'm going to start with the hidden movement piece for the very simple reason that I am generally not a hidden movement fan. I have very fond memories as a kid playing Scotland Yard, but my mother gifted me a copy of Scotland Yard a few years ago for Christmas. And despite being excited for it, I set it up, I played it a few times and I just didn't find any enjoyment in the game. And unfortunately, that's sort of how I feel about most hidden deduction games. But with all of that being said, this game breaks that streak. I really enjoy the, the hidden movement in this game. And there are some reasons. And the main reason I'm going to point out are the components that we talked about. This game comes with those four tracker tokens, the, the sort of profile silhouette tokens of the Dark Lady. And you can use those to track the location of the Dark Lady on the map. Now in the rule book, it does so say that those are optional use. I would not say that they are optional use. For me, I will use them every single time I play because I think those are what makes the game fun or at least that piece of the game fun for me. I don't like in a hidden movement game the, the sort of feeling that I have to take copious amounts of notes to try and figure out where are all the possible places this person could have gone where they could have gone from that point and then from that point and sort of tracking this whole network of, of possible pathways in my head or on a piece of paper, it just doesn't work for me and it's not exciting, it's not fun. I have had some fun being the person who's hiding and being the person who's running away, but in this game it's solo and there is nobody doing that, so that's beside the fact. But the point is here, using those tracking tokens on the map, and the map is a little bit smaller than most hidden movement games, but using those tracking tokens on the map, I can visually see where all the possible locations are that the Dark Lady could be. And then using those locations, when I see the next location come up, I can instantly understand, well, these are the possible options. And now I'm not weighing sort of the idea of where the person is gone, but instead I'm weighing the percentage or the probability that person might be in a specific location. Maybe there's a one in three chance, maybe there's a 50-50 chance. And using those probabilities and sort of estimating the risk I have by taking the chance to search in a place versus waiting to see if they move into a different location or chasing them around the map, 
These are all decisions that I find a whole lot more interesting than that sort of just mental taxation of where did they go and where should I go and I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't get that here, right? I like that decision making of do I search now? Do I wait a turn or two? Do I pursue and then search? These are the kinds of things that this game does for me and I really, really, really like that. Now, the next step is the deduction piece. And I am generally a very big fan of deduction, although I should add an extra little piece to that. I am a very big fan of logical deduction games. If it's a deduction that I can use real logical analysis to combine what all of the information that I know to come to some kind of conclusion that makes sense logically with what I know, that's a fun puzzle for me. I mean, I am a science teacher. I did study science. In school so this idea of math and science logical puzzle stuff is something that I've always been interested in and this kind of a deduction game brings that and I am happy to say that this game does wonderfully and I'm especially happy to say that because it's very rare to find a so soloable deduction game very often there are deduction games that you're competing with somebody else to do something faster than the other person and that's not what this is this is a solo only game so not only does it offer a solo mode, but it is specifically designed to be a deduction game for solo players. And I think that's great because the puzzle here that's presented is, is wonderful. You saw it in my playthrough and each of these cards has these sort of three symbols and a, a number of how many of those symbols are going to be matching the symbols on the card that you're trying to deduce. And you really have to work out this puzzle about well, if there's two of these that are correct and one of those that's correct and one of these that's correct, what's going to happen? And you saw me work through some of that puzzle in the playthrough. But the nice thing is because the cards are different every time, because the order of the cards coming out and how those cards interact with other cards is different every time, while the puzzle style is the same each game, the puzzle itself is going to change. And you might ask, is this replayable? Will I understand the patterns? You're not going to memorize the patterns. Even if you remember who the lady is on that card, you're not going to remember the three symbols. And then you can always make it that you're, you have to come up with the correct logical decision or the proof of those three symbols in order to win the game. So even if you did memorize the symbols, there's still the pattern, there's still the plan, there's still the need to come up with the right clues to prove that what you've shown is correct. So I don't think there's any problem with replay replayability in this game. And we'll come back to that in a minute when I start talking a little bit more about the, the nitty gritty of the mechanisms in this game. Now, the one thing that does need to be said about the deduction piece is there is a slight bit of luck involved. And let me explain what I mean by that. When you search and you find the dark lady, you get a clue from the clue deck. And the clue deck is a set of cards. And those cards are shuffled, which means the order that those cards are coming out in is going to be random decided by that shuffle, right? And what that means is you could have two cards come out in a row that says two of these are correct, two of these are correct. And now you've got probably one decided. And if not definitely one decided, then a good idea for most of them, if not all three of the symbols on your card that you're trying to deduce. So what that means is you might get lucky. Or if you've got two cards that come out in a row that say zero or two, now you really have no information. So there are some games when you may need more clues to solve the puzzle. There are some games when you find, might solve the puzzle earlier, like you saw in the playthrough that I had today. But there's not really any way to get around that. I mean, that's just the way that a game like this is going to work. And honestly, I don't think it ruins the experience in any way because you're still solving the puzzle. And if you worry about the score at the end of the game, like I said, the score is pretty much optional anyway. And if you're worried about that, sometimes you're going to score well, sometimes you're not. That's just the way the game works. And you'll try your best to do the best that you can. And maybe you'll push your luck one or two times and try and guess the solution before you actually have all of the information. And that's fun too. So I don't find the randomness making the game any better or any worse based on the luck of the draw. And it's not that long a game. So if you have an easy game and you want to play again with a better challenge, set it back up and play again, or maybe try on a higher difficulty level in the next game. It really doesn't change things that much that this randomness exists, and I'm fine with that. Now, 
I've talked about how I feel about the game as far as these two mechanisms are concerned, but I want to focus on the designer for a second. John Keane, this is a name that I've recently come to really, really, really be on the lookout for. If you haven't seen it yet, I did recently review another one of his games called Wonder Tales from Button Shy. Click the link above if you haven't, because I definitely recommend you check that out. But I am becoming a really, really big fan of John Keane's work. This is now the second game of his that I've played, and I really, really, really enjoyed this game a lot. Same thing that I could say for Wonder Tales, I'll say now. I just think that his designs are, are very, very creative and unique and interesting, and this one in particular. I've already talked about how the mechanisms work, but I haven't talked about sort of the design that goes behind them, and it it's, it's just blows my mind some of the things going on here. So we were just talking about deduction, so let me keep talking about the deduction and talk about those cards. I said that there's some randomness that determines you know, what kind of clues you got and when, but I feel very strongly, and again, I don't know because I didn't design this game and I haven't really dug deep into sort of grinding the numbers or trying to figure out what's going on in the background, but I suspect that those cards are laid out in a very unique way to sort of intentionally give you a certain amount of information on each card. And you'll notice that every color or every symbol has two cards. One of them is the one you're trying to deduce and the other one is the one that goes underneath the location card. So that when you've gone to all the locations, you get that one card. And I suspect that that one card under the locations is going to have really, really good clues or really, really helpful clues that make it worthwhile for you to traverse the map rather than just hanging out in one corner, sort of waiting for the lady to walk past or waiting for the lady to be in a specific spot. So it's really to your advantage to explore this map. And this idea of which clues go on which cards and how they interact with each other must have taken a lot of design work, and I appreciate that here. But more importantly than that, let's go back to the hidden movement for a section because this is a solo hidden movement game. And that means that the entire hidden movement system is designed to work through an AI system. And that AI system is a single set of cards, but it's designed in such a way that that single set of cards can be set up in at least eight different ways. And that's only using the letters that are printed on the card, right? If you use those letters at the top of the card, the AI moves every turn. If you use the, uh, the letters at the bottom of the card, they usually move every turn, but every once in a while they'll stay in one location. But then also in the rule book, there's a page of easy, there's a page of normal, there's a page of hard, more setups for these cards. So a single stack of, of 26 cards if you use the regular letters and maybe a little bit more if you use the ones from the book. But this single stack of cards presents a wide variety of different sort of pathways that the AI is walking through the map. And then the idea that every time I search, the AI moves forward more steps that I have to pay attention to, or every time I search, I add one of those fog cards, which makes one of those spaces now unknown to me. So just the idea that there's an easy way, not easy as far as designing, but as, as far as running this system to come up with this wide variety of semi-intelligent movement choices that the AI is making. And it's not changing based on your reaction or your decisions, that's fine. I mean, it would make it too difficult if, if it was anyway, but that this pathway is so flexible, it just, the design thought that goes into this just blows my mind. It's, it's very elegant system the way that the card gets placed on the location and you use the hole in the card to see if you're in the right location, all of it works together just so well and it's just so charming the way it works. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's how I feel. It's just really, really cool to see it all work and really cool to think about how John Keane's brain must have been running through all of these different connections and different pathways and thoughts as he built this game and it just, it shines, and I think this is a wonderful, wonderful display of design creativity. So I think I've basically said everything I can say. I'm not a fan of hidden movement, but I love what's being done here with hidden movement. I am a fan of deduction, and I really love what's being done here with deduction. 
I never thought I'd see a solo mode that was both hidden movement and deduction, and not just a solo mode, but a completely original solo game. I'm thrilled with this design. I was a fan of Wonder Tales. I'm a huge fan of this game, and I cannot wait to see what John Keane does next. There is an expansion for this game. I will definitely be taking a look at that expansion if I can get my hands on it, because I can only hope for more depth and more interesting twists to this system. I definitely recommend that if you are a fan of Hidden Movement, if you are a fan of Deduction, and if you are a solo player, definitely, definitely check out this game. I hope you enjoyed what you saw today, and if you did, please remember to like and subscribe below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.